Um, and I am recording this meeting um, just so that uh, you have it available uh, later on um, should we uh, need to uh, you know, review it or, or if you want to look at certain slides down the line. Um, there's going to be a link. You can visit our NCADE YouTube site. If you go to YouTube and just search for NCADE, you'll be able to find this recording. Um, now, the next point I want to uh, mention here is that uh, there's this idea of lifelong learning. So um, when it comes to scholarship, you, you want to kind of uh, develop and maintain your expertise. And one of the ways that you can do that is to um, attend conferences, for example. Um, you want to uh, pass down your own expertise by way of uh, presenting at conferences. And you, you know, as a sort of uh, tangible uh, aspect of this, um, you also get continuing education credits um, for attending conferences. So uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to look at your own individual uh, sanctioning body for how continuing education credits work. But um, in the majority of cases, you will get continuing education credits for attending conferences. <clears throat> Uh, it's also important to, you know, maintain and pass on your expertise by learning about trends, learning about emerging treatments, learning about the efficacy of treatments that you are using. Um, so, for example, if you're a fan of a certain uh, therapy and uh, you attend a conference and somebody's giving a presentation on, you know, the results that they found working with a certain client population using a certain therapy, then that's something you're going to want to know. So just an example of, uh, of sort of maintaining expertise. Um, Next up is competitiveness. So what experience sets you apart? Um, and you know, it's one thing to you know, have word of mouth and, and developing your client base and, uh, and building a name for yourself by uh, virtue of the quality of the work that you do. Um, but having uh, conference presentations on your CV is a direct sign, it's a tangible sign that you work in this field, you've presented your research, and it's, and it's been sort of um, uh, put into the, the community, as it were, of, of science. Um, it's, it's kind of like earning uh, medals for service, if you will. Um, there's that line that says, look, this is what this person has done, and you can see it right there in a tangible way. Um, and that makes it more competitive, obviously. And then finally, um, there's this aspect of networking. So when you um, think about uh, Networking, you can think of it in two different ways. What can you do for or with someone? What can you provide as an expert um, to help someone in their work? And then the opposite is also true. What can they do as an expert um, to help you or, or, or how can you work together? Um, and conferences are a very big part of how this all happens. You know, you meet someone and uh, you chat with them either at a poster or during a Q&A session, during a coffee break, what have you. Um, it's just a great way to sort of uh, meet like-minded people who are working on the same kinds of problems um, and trying to help the same uh, populations, for example. So um, all these things are very important to scholarship um, and, it, and it's just good in terms of professional development to keep all these things in mind as you uh, move forward in your career. And you know, as I will stress, uh, conferences are a great way to um, develop all of these aspects of your uh, professional career. And uh, you know, I keep going on and on about expertise um, and experience. There's, it's no coincidence that I showed up most, multiple times in the last slide. Um, you want to be known as an expert. Um, you want to be known by other experts. And uh, these are both ways to, to you know, eventually get referrals, um, whether it be for research opportunities, um, other types of collaborations, or um, have clients refer to you. Um, and, and this is a very important point, right? For a lot of us, uh, uh, getting clients is a, a very important part of um, career development. And uh, the question becomes, you know, who are discerning clients going to seek out? Um, and as it turns out, research shows that patient social networks are involved in seeking treatment. So again, you want to be known as an expert. Um, you want to be not only good at your job, but be known as being good at your job, right? So um, it's important to be able to, to demonstrate that you are in fact good at uh, what you do. And again, presenting at conferences and networking are going to be a big part of that. Okay. Now, I've already sort of talked about this, but you know, presenting at conferences is a means to achieving all of these different career goals. So um, you can attend different sessions at conferences. You can learn from experts and colleagues. Um, you can network with other experts. 
um, you know, to gain insights, to learn about career opportunities, um, and uh, of course to disseminate your own work where you become the expert, right? Um, you will be the one who's presenting uh, and, and your opinion will be sought out about um, whatever niche field you're, you're working in. And of course, um, every time that you present at a conference, you can add it to your CV or your resume to, again, demonstrate that you are uh, competent and, uh, and an expert in the field that you've chosen. Um, now, of course, you're going to have to find the correct conference to do all this at, and I'll cover that later on in the presentation. Okay, so um, just a quick note about the different types of conference presentation formats. Um, basically, the, uh, there are uh, four different um, formats. The first is an individual talk. This is where you have, you know, your big shots in the field um, giving like an hour-long presentation. You've got your Mary Ainsworth, for example, that will give a presentation. Your Aaron Becks are out there who are, um, you know, well-established experts who will, um, you know, give a sort of overview of their field or their work. Um, and that is a way that you can keep up with uh, current developments in your field. Um, the next one on here is uh, a colloquium or a symposium, and, and this is where you'll have a related series of, uh, of quick presentations, maybe 15 minutes apiece, um, that are given back to back, followed by a little bit of uh, Q&A, some, some questions and answers that um, the, the panelists uh, will, uh, will answer questions. Um, and, and this kind of format presents a sort of consensus about a given topic. You often see in a program that it's you know, basically uh, a certain topic that's being covered and you've got four different people who are, uh, or maybe five people, what have you, um, giving uh, summaries of their work and, and uh, a consensus is generally built out of that uh, series of presentations. Um, next up we've got panel discussions. Uh, these are much more interactive. It's much more of a, a question and answer kind of uh, uh, interactive format with uh, multiple experts sort of debating the points in an emerging field, for example. So less of a consensus and more of a uh, of a debate. And that's really a debate, more maybe maybe a discussion is more of an appropriate term. Uh, but anyway, it's just uh, almost helping people think about a certain idea or a certain uh, uh, current controversy in the field. Um, and then finally, you've got the poster session, and these are much more individual. You see this picture that I have down here on the bottom right, and you can see that each one of these little uh, rectangles is an individual poster. So whereas on one end of the spectrum, we've got an individual uh, giving a presentation, on this other end of the spectrum, you've got you know, tons of new ideas that are being presented by lots of individuals. And this is uh, where we're going to focus in on, right? Um, it's the first step towards... Um, uh, not the first step, but, but one of the main steps and, and formats in a, uh, a career of presenting. Okay, next up, uh, right, we've got um, this idea that there's peer review involved. Right? I mentioned that briefly at the beginning. Um, and you can, depending on the conference anyway, you can submit your work as any one of these different formats, whether it's a, a colloquium proposal, a poster, or uh, an individual talk. Um, you would write it in the appropriate format and uh, it would hopefully be accepted uh, following peer review. Okay, uh, but we are going to focus in on poster sessions, right? So um, essentially what we have is uh, these images here, right? And you'll notice they all have one thing in common, which is a person sort of talking with an audience and uh, using um, this poster session as a sort of uh, interactive way to present their work. People can ask questions. Um, it's basically you talking to people who come by and are interested in your work um, from looking at a program. Usually a conference will have a program where you have, you know, each one hour session has a list of posters and people will, you know, circle in the program or use an app, what have you, to, um, uh, to find the posters that they want to visit. And so there you have people congregating around individual posters and the presenter um, speaking with them and using the poster as a visual aid. You don't want to be reading from your poster. Um, that's, that's what you would write a paper for, where you have you know, all the details spelled out. Um, and in a poster, on the other hand, it's really more of a visual aid, where you can point to a figure and say, look, here's, here's what I've been talking about, here's the result we found, and you can see you know, what the differences are by looking at the graph. Um, but it's important to note that the poster is a visual aid, not a crutch. Um, okay, 
So uh, next up, um, let's take a quick uh, pause. Um, let's see if there are any questions. I just want to make sure that uh, uh, I'm not talking too fast. If there's anything you want to um, ask, uh, shoot. How in depth should the poster be? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the poster itself should provide a, uh, a general overview of what you did. The most detailed aspect of a poster is the results section. Um, by providing a lot of detail in the results, you will be able to um, basically address any kind of unique question that an attendee might have. So um, generally speaking, you would essentially have everything up here, right? And um, you're using the poster to sort of refer to um, specific aspects of the study um, that might be easier to, um, to communicate by way of a figure or by way of a bulleted series of results. Um, but generally speaking, you want to keep it general. I'm, I'm going to have a little bit more detail on all that in, uh, in the next slides. Hopefully that, um, that addresses the, uh, the question. Um, what size should the poster be? That's also an excellent question. I'll get to that as well. It should, generally speaking, three feet uh, tall by four feet wide. Um, and then there is uh, another question. Uh, would you speak some to the experience of poster sessions, how to talk to multiple people? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, in my experience, um, I find that making good eye contact um, and sort of uh, giving a brief overview while looking at each individual participant in turn is the best way to go. You can start to get a sense. You develop your own style as you go. Um, but essentially, what will happen is someone will come up and they'll kind of look at your poster, they'll kind of you know, nod their head, kind of maybe go like this and hmm, kind of frown a little bit. Uh, and then they might ask a question. Um, you can give them a little bit of time and just stand off to the side and say, oh, you know, um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and oftentimes what someone will do is ask, hey, can you walk me through what you did here? And that's where you come in and give your little um, uh, sort of impromptu uh, presentation on what you did. And then, you know, people will maybe join in, questions will be asked, and it's very fluid. So again, as I said, you kind of develop your own style, and um, you have, typically you'll have an hour. So you'll basically be able to um, uh, give your little uh, spiel, as it were, uh, a number of times, and you know, at the next conference you'll be that much better at it, right? Um, hopefully that uh, that addresses uh, your question, Gene. Um, another question. Um, Oh, that's a very interesting uh, question, Julie. Um, yeah, so, so the question is, um, my proposed session was based on generating participant data, aka action research, but it was accepted as a poster. How can I convert such an interactive approach? Um, and I do think we should talk about this later. You'll see my contact info at the end, but I think you already have my contact info, Julie. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, a little bit too in-depth for this presentation. Um, and then finally, there's a question. Do you use note cards or a handout? I do use handouts, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, later on. I don't use note cards though. Note cards I think should be reserved for uh, a talk where you're you know sort of more at a, a lecture style presentation as opposed to a more interactive style uh, which is what a, a poster presentation would be. Oh the question was do you use note cards or a handout? Okay so um, Oh, the question before that one was about uh, action research and converting uh, a, a conference proposal that was a, uh, intended as a uh, as a session, like a like a symposium or a colloquium, but was accepted as a poster. And that happens sometimes. Um, and essentially, uh, it, it's a it's a very in depth question because you have to convert something that was designed in one way into uh, a, a different format. But for this presentation, I really want to focus on posters. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, Julie, we've got uh, so Gene Hartman is interested in the same question. So um, maybe you want to email both of us and we can set up a meeting to, to discuss that. Okay. Um, but for everyone else, let's, uh, let's move on to some design guidelines. This is where we really start to get into the meat and potatoes 
uh, of how to work on uh, a poster. So uh, first off, I want to um, talk about things to avoid before I move into things to, to seek. Uh, basically, you don't want to over rely on text. You see this, uh, this first example up here in the top left, it's just all text, and that's something you definitely want to avoid. Um, again, the poster is a visual aid, not a paper. If you want to you know, um, submit a paper to a conference, you can um, have that accepted and give a presentation on it more like a lecture style. Um, but when it comes to a poster, uh, you really want to um, avoid just having tons and tons of text on it. Uh, similarly, if you don't have figures or tables on there, that's a problem. You want to be able to talk to your audience uh, and, and be able to point to a figure and say, look, here's, here's the result I'm, I'm focusing on now. You can see here's the difference that, that we found. Um, there's also an issue of visual flow, and I'll give some examples of this. <clears throat> but basically, if you have a, a poster that's sort of uh, unbalanced and the eye is not drawn to the appropriate sections, um, that's going to become distracting. And uh, when somebody's looking at the poster, they won't be they won't know where to focus their attention um, because some people prefer that. Some people prefer to just look at your poster, take in for themselves and maybe ask a question or two as opposed to listening to a presentation. They might even ignore the presentation as you're giving it to a couple of people who are interested and just kind of you know digest the poster at their own pace. So you want it to be designed well and we'll look at some strategies to do that. Um, and also distracting visual effects. Um, let's look at a couple of examples of distracting visual effects. Hopefully you can see that different color combinations are better than others. Um, Consider this not only in the sense of uh, designing your poster, but also in terms of the environment. If you have a poster with a black background, that is going to waste a ton of ink. Um, and it's also going to wrinkle the paper. So typically, it's better to have a white background. Just leave the background alone. And if you're going to be using any colors, um, use them as the foreground. But in any case, um, that's one sort of distracting visual effect is having um, you know, the, the wrong color combination. Again, my background, visual perception, human factors, this is a real big pet peeve for me. Um, okay, here's another example. Um, you'll see here that it relies very heavily on text. Um, it has you know, these sort of um, images all over the place. The title is super fancy. The background has you know, basically what might even appear to be more text. Um, and you know, it, it also doesn't really um, give you a sense of where to focus in on at any given time. Obviously, there are section headings, but they're kind of all over the place. The text boxes are all over the place, and um, you know, it's it's just poorly organized. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about you know the positives, as opposed to what to avoid. What can you do? Uh, to make your poster the best it can be. Um, again, as I mentioned, you should be focusing on figures and tables. You'll notice that in these two examples on the left-hand side of the screen here, uh, the central piece is a figure, right? And that's where um, your results would basically go. The backbone of a poster is uh, either a figure or a table that very quickly summarizes what you did. Um, you'll also see regarding visual flow that these sections are sort of broken up symmetrically left to right or sort of top left to bottom right. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the eye is led to um, the important parts of the poster. Um, it's important to note that when we're talking about text, I mentioned don't, over, uh, don't rely too much on text. Um, you should use text, certainly, but only to provide the absolutely necessary information to communicate what the findings were. Um, for example, a bulleted list of results, a list of hypotheses, a list of conclusions. Um, and you also want to use um, appropriate font sizes. Um, the heading should be a larger font than the body of the text, right? That um, goes along with APA format. Uh, so we have a question here. How do you summarize what you've done if you're presenting a research question? What sections are to be included? That's a really good question. Um, if you're presenting a research question, if you're at the early stages of uh, developing your research, um, you certainly want to focus more on uh, creating bulleted lists. Um, you're going to be focusing more on the literature review. Um, 
developing, you know, how uh, you um, arrived at your hypotheses. Um, you can certainly include something like a flowchart where um, you can present, for example, you know, a few different theoretical backgrounds and then have arrows pointing to um, a hypothesis, for example. Something that very quickly communicates what then um, you go into a little bit more depth on using uh, text. Hopefully that, that answers the question a little bit. Um, if you have a follow-up, certainly uh, go right ahead. In the meantime, um, is there a range of sections that you should have? No less than a number and no more than a number. Uh, I will actually uh, talk about that um, in a couple of minutes, actually. Uh, that's a very good question. And yes, there is typically a set of sections that you would have with some flexibility. OK. Um, so OK, we're looking at you know just sort of these templates. Um, let me give you an example of a poster. Um, and uh, there's another question, will you talk about what goes into the method section? Um, not really, because that's going to be unique to uh, every single poster. I will give some general guidelines of what to put into a method section, though. OK, so here's, uh, not to toot my own horn, uh, this is a poster that um, I presented at APA a few years ago. Um, and the reason that I have it up here as an example of a good poster is because um, this won an award for best poster. Uh, for Division Three at APA. So um, I feel like it, it serves as a pretty decent example. And you'll notice there's a lot of information on here, right? On your screen, it looks pretty small. But when you blow up to three feet by four feet, it gave me an opportunity to really look at every single result that I found. Not every single one, but, you know, um, a good amount of what I found and be able to walk people through it and say, look, here's the effect of uh, manipulating information. Here's the effect of um, the delay at which people have to recall information, things of this sort. And you'll notice that what I did was I broke them into multiple sections. You'll see that I have these, uh, these sort of outlines that uh, separate the different sections, right? And um, basically, there's a section on background. There's a whole section on method. There's a whole section on results, brief discussion, and references. And um, here, there's also this, this notion of a visual flow, right? You'll see that there's... Uh, from from the background in the top left to the uh, to the discussion in the bottom right, there's a sort of progression through uh, the study, as it were. Literally, from the background to the discussion, you have to go through the results. Um, and uh, you know, this is just one example, right? But basically, the idea is always the same. Depending on what your study is, you always have these uh, uh, these sections set in place. There's a background. There's a method. There are the results, which you'll notice take up the majority of the poster, um, and the discussion, and finally references. Anything you cite has to be uh, has to be cited. And again, it, it, the, I can't stress this enough that the poster ser uh, serves as a visual aid. Again, everything you already know this if you've presented it. I'm sorry, if you've been working on it, you've been analyzing your data, you've been developing your research question, whatever stage of the game you're at, you are well acquainted with. Um, with what you're working on. And so it's up to you to decide what the most important information to present is going to be. Um, whatever you choose, remember, you're going to be using it as a visual aid to be able to discuss your study with your attendees and uh, be able to point at the poster and say, you know, here's, here's what I mean by, you know, the effect of, um, you know, treatment on, say, depression. Um, OK. So uh, next up, I want to talk about the, um, the specific question, uh, the specific sections of the poster. But before that, I see there's a question. Um, maybe quantitative data lends better to poster presentation. Talk to qualitative data if you're able or share your thoughts. Uh, certainly, yes. Um, I agree that uh, figures are better suited to quantitative data. Um, with qualitative data, uh, you typically would want to have, um, for example, a summary of themes, and you would want to put that center stage on your poster. What themes emerged from your interviews, for example. Um, and there, you know, certainly that would be more of a, uh, uh, a textual uh, component, but it would be presented in a way that is very easily accessible. So um, even if it's a bulleted list, you would want to make it uh, so that it's, easy to see. You can directly point to it and say, you know, this is the main finding of the study, 
right? Um, images, you can certainly use example images. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're on the same page here. Uh, you're kind of reading my mind there, Julie. Um, you can certainly use examples uh, from uh, video transcripts if you recorded interviews and you want to highlight a certain um, maybe facial expression um, or if you want to uh, use a frequency table where you, you can present the number of times a certain theme appears, that's also very appropriate, um, which is more of almost a mixed methods approach where you take qualitative data and present it in a way that, that shows, okay, look, nine out of ten of my participants talked about uh, this theme. And, uh, and you can present that uh, like as a pie chart, for example. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that you could do that. Um, for now, uh, I'm going to move on. Um, if there are still questions at the end, um, then certainly you know, we, can, we can chat about it a little bit more. Uh, these are great questions, by the way, so, so please keep them coming. Um, there are, so, so someone asked a question about what are the, um, the sections of a uh, of a poster. This is, should look familiar to some of you. This is basically APA format um, where you've got the title, the abstract, the introduction, the methods, the results, the discussion, and then uh, acknowledgments and references. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to go through each of these uh, in turn and uh, from there um, look at a little bit of a, a way to technically put all this together. Okay, so the title, um, you should try to stick to 12 words or less, um, align it, you know, center, not left, not right. Um, also choose a large font, it should be legible from far away. Remember, at a conference, people are kind of walking around, some people are, you know, overwhelmed by the number of, uh, of studies that are being presented. Um, and also if they're looking for your particular study, they're looking for the title that is, again, in the program of the conference. So you want it to be um, legible, high contrast, um, and uh, you know, visible from far away. Um, you should also include the names of the authors, um, the institution and the department, and the uh, contact information. The last part about contact information, some people are on you know, uh, the other side of uh, this idea where they don't want to include contact information, and the reason is that um, they would only provide it if someone asked. So it's a way to sort of gauge the interest of somebody who comes to, uh, uh, to listen to your, uh, not listen, but to, you know, to attend your, um, your poster. And if they ask for your email, then it's like, aha, this is actually going to be a good contact that I just made. So some people prefer not to include their email, but it's a, it's a matter of choice, really. Anyway, um, for, the, uh, for the author names and all this other information, uh, you want to choose a smaller font than the title, but a larger font than the text that appears in the in the body of the poster. Um, okay, let's move on to the abstract and the introduction. So this is where you want to um, provide a, an overview of what's being studied, the theoretical background. Um, you want to highlight how previous research informed the direction of the current study, right? So for example, um, you might identify the gaps that exist in our current knowledge about a topic. You could highlight uh, things that are controversial, things you know, that have been found that are contradictory in different studies that then you know, logically lead into your research question or your hypothesis. And this last note about taking up at most one-third of the poster, this is obviously going to apply to completed studies. If we're talking about um, for example, students who are going to be presenting at the GRF who are presenting the research question, this doesn't really apply, right? This is where you're going to take up more space to really go into more depth about the theoretical background, the, the previous research, and, and, and how it leads into um, your specific study. But for completed studies, certainly um, you don't want to take up too much space with, uh, um, with the background. Um, and again, remember that you're, you're not going to be reading this, right? You want it to be easy to digest. You don't want to have, you know, basically like a research paper that's shoehorned into, um, you know, one column of a poster. You really want to just highlight the main points that someone would need to understand in order to um, uh, clearly know what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you found. So certainly bulleted lists are something I'm a big fan of, <laughs> if, in case you couldn't tell from this PowerPoint. Um, okay, next up is the method. This is uh, also very important. 
um, in, in light of you know, the results, because the method and the results are obviously going to go hand in hand. And it also harkens back to the hypothesis, right? If your hypothesis is consistent with the methods that you then choose, then the results should also follow in a logical order. Um, basically, you want to describe the design, right? What is it that you did? How did you study the phenomenon that you studied? Um, most important here is to provide what are called operational definitions, meaning um, the instruments that you used. Uh, so for example, you know, if you're uh, studying depression, you want to say, okay, well, the Beck depression inventory scores were analyzed, right? Um, you could also include criteria for inclusion in a group if you're, you know, um, creating an experiment. Um, you also want to describe your sample, your participants, um, or whatever groups you generated. So the number of participants, the demographic characteristics, whatever is relevant, every study is going to be different. You know, if you're doing a study on uh, depression, you're going to have different demographic information or descriptive information about your sample listed than if you're doing a study on, um, say, uh, you know, homelessness and veterans, let's just say. There are going to be different uh, factors that are important for either of those studies to, to appropriately describe your sample. Um, the takeaway here is that you want to provide only enough information to communicate the methodology, not the full detail. Again, that, the full detail is something that you would put in, uh, in a paper. Um, but for the poster, you need only the information that's necessary to fully describe what you did. Um, you don't need to go into you know, every single last detail of you know, how the IRB was contacted and uh, review processes and all that kind of stuff, for example. Um, again, a paper would include all of that information. Now, the, the really important part for those of you who are uh, presenting completed studies is the results. I can't stress this enough, focusing on figures and or tables. For qualitative studies, um, this also applies. Uh, it just um, really changes the content of the figure or table. Um, Martha, maybe you want to elaborate on what you mean by not the testing, such as analysis regression. I'll come back to that. Um, you want to include captions underneath each graphic, whether it's a table, whether it's a figure. Um, you always want to describe in a caption what variables are being presented or um, what information overall is being presented and uh, describe what the figure is showing. So if you're showing a comparison between two groups and you're showing a significant effect, um, then you want to outline that in the, um, in the caption. If you're describing some kind of uh, qualitative analysis, then you certainly want to include uh, what the reader uh, should be focusing on. Aha, OK, I see. So the question is, um, do we include uh, whether the data were analyzed in a regression or, an, or an ANOVA? Uh, certainly you would want to make a note of that, yes, um, because that would help the reader understand uh, what it is that they're looking at in terms of the results. So if you say, okay, in the results you have a p-value, but you don't say what the design was, um, then it becomes difficult to understand why you're reporting a p-value. So certainly you can say, you know, regression was used to analyze the data, or um, an ANOVA was used, and here are the factors. Right? So you would, um, again, harken back to this idea of, um, of operational definitions. No, you can, you, can use, you can describe your statistical analysis in the method. I think that would be appropriate because it's part of you know, what you did. And then the results are the results of the analysis. Hopefully that makes sense. And you can do both as well. I mean, some people choose to, to put, you know, an ANOVA revealed that there was an effect, right? But um, overall, it is technically part of the method. Now, um, let me make a quick note here about results and how they factor into the method and how the method factors into the hypotheses. If you have multiple hypotheses, your method, the, way, the order in which you list your hypotheses at the beginning of the poster should be reflected in the order in which you describe your methods, should be reflected in the order in which you present results, just to be consistent. OK, following the results, you have that brief little discussion section towards the end, right? You just want to briefly summarize the main findings. You want to present the importance um, and relevance of the findings. 
um, and importantly, how they fit into the current state of knowledge in the field. So just like with all the other sections, you want to reconnect uh, what the meaning of your results is with what your original uh, sort of intention was in the introduction, in the, in the abstract of, uh, at the beginning of the poster. Um, and finally, you can suggest you know, a couple of future directions for research on the topic. This uh, is important for both um, uh, posters that are presenting completed studies and uh, for posters that are relatively early in development, where your study, your, your, your research question should logically um, lead to a study that you can propose that should be conducted in the future, whether it's by you or someone else. Okay, so there's a question. If I'm presenting on a practical application of current research, should I treat my poster like a pre-results poster or include the results of others' data that I base my practical application on? That's a very good question, Dustin. Um, in my opinion, um, what you're doing is presenting kind of a lit review. Um, that's what I'm sort of gathering from the question. Uh, and basically, it seems like you can uh, summarize the, uh, the current state of the field and um, as you say, include the results of others' data. Basically provide a summary of what they found and, um, and then demonstrate how you can synthesize that into you know, action in, in, uh, in your practice. And the level of detail, I think, is going to depend on a lot of different things, so perhaps we can, we can need to discuss this. Um, but for now, I think, um, I think you're definitely on the right track here. Okay, um, Okay. last but not least, acknowledgments and references. Uh, basically, if you had anyone who assisted you, uh, maybe it's somebody who provided feedback, somebody who mentored you, uh, or somebody who uh, helped you collect data, whatever the case may be, if they're not a, uh, you know, an author but they you know, somehow contributed, you want to acknowledge them. Um, and this can include participants, right? Um, certainly without them, science is uh, not science at all. And finally, you want to list uh, all the references in APA format of anything, uh, any studies that you cited. So for some people, if you're doing like, you know, a big lit review, um, this is going to take up more space. Okay, um, let me pause there, catch my breath, um, see if there are any questions. I think we're going at a pretty good clip here. Um, let me talk a little bit about how to actually put a poster together. Technically speaking, this is um, you know a novel undertaking for a lot of folks. So let's take a look here. Um, there is a question. Uh, what are best practices for transferring an in-person poster presentation to an online poster presentation? Does it become similar to the defense presentation? Yes. Um, for the online sessions, I, I assume you're talking about the, the GRF, Leanne, and um, it sounds like you're going to be doing an online presentation. Uh, essentially, what you're going to be doing is there's going to be um, uh, a go-to meeting organized, and you're going to have the opportunity to present kind of the way that I'm presenting um, right now. Uh, you're going to be able to do something similar. And um, there's a lot more flexibility with the online GRF, where you can have a series of slides or you can have uh, one slide, which is the same exact format as a poster, and then you can literally use, um, let's see, there's a, there's a, mm, is it shift? No. Uh, there's a way in PowerPoint, I, I forget what it is exactly, but you can, um, you can make it behave like a laser pointer. Uh, I thought it was control, click. yeah, there it is. Okay, so if you hit control and click, you see that you can, uh, you can draw people's attention to certain parts of the screen, right? And um, that's one way that you can uh, basically do the same thing as at a live poster presentation, except uh, uh, through GoToMeeting. Um, next, there's a question on citing. Is there citing in the text or just references? Do we number the information in the text? Um, I would say that uh, as far as citing goes, it's the same as if you're writing, uh, you know, a research paper. So you can say, um, you know, based on the theory of Smith and Jones, 1982, you know, uh, this is, you know, what, what I'm focusing my study on. Um, and that would go in the uh, abstract part of the poster. Then at the, at the very bottom right where you have the references section, you have the full, you know, Smith, first initial, 
and Jones, first initial year, full title, you know, the, the, uh, the, article, uh, the journal and the volume and the page numbers and all that kind of stuff. So basically, um, that's how you would, you know, you would just cite it in the text and then have uh, the references at the end. So any, any, any citation in the text of the poster gets a reference at the end in the references section. It's not a bibliography per se. It's, it's, what, you, um, it's what you cite in the poster is what's referenced uh, at the end. Yeah, that laser thing is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, Martha, yes, if, uh, if they want you to do an actual PowerPoint presentation, perfectly fine. Um, if you uh, want to get uh, uh, better at presenting, certainly that's a very good uh, way to do it. I'm just saying it's an option to present it as a poster uh, if, if that's something you're more comfortable with. Um, how many citations is acceptable? Uh, typically for a poster, if you're talking about a, uh, an empirical study, you would have a handful, maybe up to five references that are the sort of key pieces, uh, maybe they're theoretical or empirical pieces that are central to your study, and you would cite those. For something like a research question uh, poster or a literature review poster, you would certainly have a lot more uh, references because the focus is different. Um, if presenting a more philosophical or theoretical poster, critical review of the literature, would I present my own thoughts in the discussion based on literature presented in the results? Uh, it depends on what your focus is. Um, I would say that if you are synthesizing the literature into uh, a set of actionable items, um, for example, if you're trying to influence uh, practice, then you would obviously take, you would draw appropriate conclusions from that lit review based on that question. Um, if it's more about developing your own research, then, you know, you would synthesize it with that in mind, um, where it would be more along the lines of your own thoughts. Um, but generally speaking, you know, it, it's a case-by-case -case thing, so perhaps um, if you want, we can, we can chat about this offline uh, at a later time. That. Okay, so let's look at, uh, at some technical ways of putting a poster together, shall we? Um, okay, first of all, uh, any conference you go to, uh, you have to de determine the required poster size. Um, typically, three feet by four feet is the standard. Um, if a conference doesn't say what the, <clears throat> what the requirement is, default to three by four. Um, if they do specify, then you should follow along with what they specify. Uh, for the GRF specifically, um, there's not a required size, but 3 by 4 is recommended. Um, a lot of folks choose to uh, print things out on individual pieces of paper and then, you know, have uh, the, the background on one or two pieces, the, you know, methods on a couple of other pieces, and then uh, literally stick them to a poster board. And, you know, that's, that's okay, um, but as far as developing... Um, sort of familiarity and uh, uh, an experience with putting posters together, it's always better to, um, you know, put together an actual three by four foot poster. It gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, now, it might cost maybe 50 or 70 bucks to, to print a poster, um, but as you'll see, uh, there are some ways to offset those costs that are available to you. So we'll talk about that at the end. Okay, so um, let me switch over into PowerPoint, not presentation mode but um, just regular old PowerPoint. Now, you may be surprised, like, he's using PowerPoint to put a poster together? That is correct. Um, a lot of people might say, oh, you need some kind of fancy software to do this, but PowerPoint does everything you would ever need to put a poster together. So um, the very first thing is, you know, to go up to the uh, Design tab and uh, Page Setup, and then you see that there are options for width and height. Now, why is it important? Look, this, this obviously looks like it's about, you know, three by four, um, but what happens is this becomes very important for printing because if, it's, if you do it 10 inches by seven and a half inches and, you know, you have text boxes, you have everything in there, when you go to blow it up into three feet by four feet, it could end up being extremely blurry. So you actually want to tell PowerPoint, okay, make this, what's four by 12, 48 by, 36. 
And what's going to happen is for you, this isn't going to make any bit of difference. See, it looks exactly the same. The only difference is that when you have a ruler up to it, you can see that the scale is much different now. Okay, so um, what we uh, what we have is um, a couple of different things that uh, become important. You'll notice, remember in the presentation, I, I gave you guys this example here of, uh, of this poster. You notice that they, they're using these different boxes to put together their poster, right? Um, what PowerPoint does is it gives you uh, text boxes. So I'm just going to delete everything off this slide, start with a blank slate, um, and basically you can insert a text box. Boom. And now you can, you know, you can make a title. Uh, here is the title of my poster. Okay? And now here's the beauty part about text boxes. You can manipulate them in any way you want. So, for example, I said, remember, you have to make your title centered, right? So now it's centered. Well, how do I make it aligned to the center of the page? Well, you just put it in the top left corner, whoops, drag it all the way across, and now guess what? It's automatically centered for you. Obviously, I said, you know, make it a bigger font. Oh, okay, that's a little too big. But there you go. Right? And now um, you can add in multiple text boxes. You can have uh, you can add headings, right? And then you can add in, you know, bulleted list of background. And then you know it's it just works like Word basically at this point. You know, here's point one. Point two, etc. I'm not going to bother spelling this all correctly. Uh, what's very interesting about uh, these these text boxes? Hang on one second. Let me get this out of the way here. Is that you can uh, you can do what's called snapping. Um, so you see that here we've got this text box, and here we've got this uh, this other text box up here. They're not aligned, right? In the end, when you have all three columns filled up with text, you're going to want to make sure that everything is aligned. And the snapping tool is a perfect way to, you know, basically make your poster really shine. Um, and the way that you do that is um, you go up here to arrange, and then uh, align, and all the way at the bottom, there's this thing called grid settings. Okay, and in here you get this little pop-up box that says. Uh, snap objects to grid or snap objects to other objects. And you want to snap objects to other objects. You can also display smart guides when shapes are aligned. And this is uh, going to make your life a whole lot easier because now when I drag, oops, when I drag this over, it will tell me, oh, okay, now it's aligned with this heading box, right? So you see that on the left side they're aligned. Now obviously it's not aligned on this side, but you know I drag this over. And boom, okay, there it goes. Now it's aligned. See that? And now when I center this heading, I know that it's exactly centered over the rest of my text here. So then, you know, you're going to be adding in all kinds of different things, right? You're going to be adding, I'm just going to do a little shorthand here for adding in a figure, right? There, let's just say that's my results there. And now if I want to move this over, you see it's, it's automatically snapping to, well, maybe you can't tell, but, you know, my mouse is like, I'm moving the mouse, but it's not actually moving the shape because it snaps to the edge of the thing that's adjacent to it. Okay, where did you go to snap objects to each other again? Yeah, this is a very important tool. So here's here's what I'm going to recommend. Instead of going, because this is this gets cumbersome after all. Sometimes you want things to snap, sometimes you don't want things to snap. So the real trick with PowerPoint, you go, so first of all, we're in Home, Arrange, Align, Grid Settings. But don't even click on this. Right-click on it. And what happens is, for me, I already have this set up, but there's this option of Add to Quick Access Toolbar. And so now, when you add it to Quick Access Toolbar, what happens is it shows up up here. Right now, you, you probably won't have all these different buttons. This is just convenience for me because... Um, I use these tools all the time. So all I have to do now is just with one click, 
it comes up. And now I can, okay, unsnap all this. I don't want this anymore. I want to be able to move this freely and not have it, you know, dictate where it stops. Or, you know, I want to go back. Okay, fine, great. Then it's right there. And we're back to, you know, snapping to edges. So this becomes a very useful tool instead of having to go back and forth, back and forth. Um, and you can apply this to anything, right? I have, you know, I have text box in here, right? Every time I have to go insert text box. No, I have it right up here, one click, and I'm ready to go. Um, so this cuts down your workload, basically. And after a while, you know, you start to fill in your headings, you start to fill in your text, you start to fill in your figures, and you can play around with how it all works together. You, you can, you know, step away from it, look at it again, see if you're happy with the way it looks, practice it, move stuff around, revise, edit everything, and, uh, and before you know it, you're, you're an old pro at this kind of thing. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is this is what I just kind of went over. Um, this, these are the steps for the snapping tool again. Um, so we just looked at that. Uh, this is the add to quick access toolbar trick I just showed you. Um, and then right, so it appears up at the top so you can have quick access to it. Now there was a question earlier um, about this topic of reprints. Um, you always want to print a handful of eight and a half by 11 copies of your poster to hand out to attendees. Uh, and this is a common practice. You know, if somebody comes to see your poster, uh, they are going to expect to have access to a reprint. So you should have maybe 10, 20, however many you feel confident about and, uh, and have those to hand out to people. Um, now, we live in the digital age, so you can also add links. Um, you can have you, you can you can find space in your poster somewhere to add a link so that anyone can instantly access uh, either you know a PDF of your poster or a link to the full paper that you wrote or your dissertation or your professional website. It's like a it's like a you know a business card almost. Um, let me just finish this point. I'll get to your question here. Um, there, there are a couple of different ways to add links into your poster. One is a so-called QR code. You might remember these were kind of hot a few years back. They've fallen out of favor, but um, you know some people still use them. So you know you can use this, and uh, there's a there's a website where you can generate QR codes um, that you can uh, visit, uh, and then you can just paste this you know uh, this type of icon into your poster somewhere where there's space. Um, you can also add a Bitly link to your poster which is easy to jot down by attendees. And basically, you know, there's this website called Bitly where you can, um, you know, you can insert a link that's like, you know, this long, and then it will shrink it down to a very, you know, simple code that somebody can uh, uh, paste into their web browser and use, uh, and, and very quickly be easy to access. So there's a question about, it seems like we might need to do a bit of guesswork about what font that one PowerPoint slide is going to look like as a 3x4 all blown up. Is there a suggested font size for most text while creating it in PowerPoint? Um, not really. The one thing I can tell you about this is that uh, when you go to um, when you go to your PowerPoint presentation, remember I made this 3 feet by 4 feet, right? So down here, this is at 16% size when you go to 100% size, this is the size it will be at. Literally, when you print it, this is the size it would be at. So when you're putting your poster together, um, you can basically uh, see, literally see what someone would see uh, from what distance away. Right now, I'm about 10 feet away from this projector, and that looks uh, pretty good, actually. So um, that is one way to, uh, to ascertain that. But um, effectively, if it looks good on the screen, it'll look good on, uh, uh, as a poster. Um, there's another question here. Can we submit GRF poster for comments from NCADE? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, you can suggest me. There's um, uh, all of the uh, NCADE dissertation writing experts and methodology experts are available to review uh, finished posters and give feedback. Um, so you can email us, uh, and we can definitely uh, help you out with that. And if somebody's overworked, they can pass on to somebody else who is, um, you know, equally uh, uh, able to provide good feedback for you, 
and certainly I'm available as well. So uh, no worries about that. Okay. Um, let's go back to the presentation. I realize we're at an hour. Um, I'm going to keep recording. So if you have to go, um, uh, you can go to YouTube and again, Google NK, then you'll see this presentation uh, and you can access it. Um, for whatever other information that uh, I'm still going to look at. There's not a lot left anyway. Um, okay, uh, next up I want to talk about um, conferences. So here's the information for the GRF. Um, by campus, uh, you know, this is where you have an opportunity to, um, not this year because we're obviously um, going to, uh, uh, it's coming up very soon and all the applications are already finalized. Everybody who uh, knows they have been accepted has have already been accepted. So next year, um, there's always uh, uh, the next GRF. But um, if you want to attend the GRF, even if you're not presenting, um, here is uh, when and where to be, depending on your campus. Um, I see there's another question. Does that count as one of the three reviews that we're eligible for? No, it does not. Um, this is a separate thing that, uh, that we're doing that doesn't count towards the full reviews of dissertation drafts. Anyway, you don't have to be a dissertating student to uh, participate in the GRF. So um, it's, you know, it's just unique and uh, it's in addition to everything else we do. Hmm. Um, okay, so uh, there are the dates um, and the times and the places. So by all means, please attend. Uh, I'm sure the presenters will appreciate uh, having folks to, uh, you know, share interest with. Now, step two, this is where it, um, we're going outside the walls of the Chicago School. Um, just to recap the goals of all this, right? Learning about relevant topics, um, networking with other experts, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, disseminating scientific findings that, that, you've, uh, that you've found, and again, bolstering your CV slash resume. All of these things are important in terms of career development and conferences are a great way to um, accomplish these things. So uh, basically, you know, this all begs the question, how do I know what conference to go to? You know, I want to make sure that I find the right people, that I, um, you know, present to an audience who actually cares about what I'm presenting about. Um, and the idea is that there's different ways. You can ask Chicago School faculty, what is the best uh, conference that I should be, um, you know, uh, submitting my, my abstract to. Um, you can also look at different organizations, look at their mission statements on their websites. Um, you can look at uh, previous convention website uh, archives. So for example, APA will have uh, programs from previous years and you can see, okay, where should I really try to fit my work? Um, and you can also think of it in terms of balancing your specific interest and general appeal. So some conferences are much bigger um, but there's more people to uh, potentially meet and work with. Um, whereas there are very specific conferences that are much smaller, but they have a you know, very specific uh, set of people who are there looking at the same kinds of uh, questions. Uh, there's another question, what is the turnaround time for reviews? Um, that's a good question. It's going to depend on workload, uh, but basically um, no more than a week. Um, that's pretty much standard for everything we do. Um, if you send us something, uh, you should expect to get feedback within a week. Um, okay, so moving on from there, uh, let me give you a couple of examples of external conferences. I mentioned APA. Um, it's really big. This is the biggest organization of psychologists in the world. It has, I think, 40 or 50,000 members. It has 56 divisions. Um, so you can have anything from you know, behavior analysis to uh, independent practice, psychoanalysis, creativity. There's all kinds of different divisions with specific interests. It's a really good conference to kind of um, an organization to get involved with. Uh, there's also the Western Psychological Association and the Eastern Psychological Association. These are um, uh, associations that are uh, very closely aligned with APA. They are almost like subunits of APA that have their own conferences. Um, so there's this idea of, you know, quantity versus quality, right? You've got a really big organization with a lot of divisions, so you can uh, not necessarily have a trade-off of quantity versus quality, right? You can, you can go to any kind of session within the APA conference um, and then present at a very specific uh, division. 
So you can um, you can have a balance of uh, quantity and quality. Um, another resource for you is to use Google. Type in your topic and the word society or association um, and add the word conference or convention and you'll basically have uh, a bunch of results that uh, that show up. So for example, um, uh, right now I'm working on a project involving art therapy. So um, I googled art therapy society convention. I found arttherapy.org uh, and guess what? There's a conference in Minneapolis in July. So I missed the uh, the deadline, but this is the way that you can start to sort of um, figure out where uh, where to look for those mission statements, where to look for um, those previous convention archives, all those different things. Okay, now I mentioned uh, expenses, right? For Chicago school students, um, there's the CSSA reimbursement scholarship. So um, this organization gives you uh, uh, money towards paying professional membership dues. Um, oftentimes, um, in order to present at the conference, you have to be a member. Um, it also helps cover conference registration uh, and conference travel, as well as printing costs. If you're presenting a poster, you know, like I said, it might cost 50, 70 bucks to, to print a poster, and uh, the CSSA provides uh, funds for all of these things. Um, so you should contact your uh, specific campus uh, uh, CSSA representative for details. Um, generally speaking, um, you can get up to about $250 depending on you know, what level of attendance you're going to be um, uh, involved in. So for example, if you're only attending a conference, that's different than if you're actually uh, uh, presenting at a conference. If a conference is down the street from campus, that's different than if it's halfway across the country, right? So um, keep that in mind. Um, there's another question. Backtracking to submission, how? Via email, I think my file hasn't been assigned. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Gene. Um, let's, w shoot me an email, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, now, there are also external opportunities. So, um, you know, when you find these different organizations that you want to present at, uh, they oftentimes have funds available for student travel. So, for example, APA uh, has a fund in which 100 students receive, <clears throat> excuse me, $300 for travel to the APA conference. There's a link there for you. Um, and, of course, you can look at specific organizations uh, and their conference websites to see if there are any opportunities. Um, another organization, uh, another question, sorry, I joined two organizations days after my last class and dissertation. Do you think that I may be able to still be reimbursed? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you should contact CSSA and, and find out. Okay, so finally, um, just a brief summary of uh, what we covered. Um, there's this expert scholar practitioner model. Um, that's part of uh, you know the Chicago School uh, emphasis. Um, you want to find, teach, and learn from other scholar practitioners. Conferences are a great way to do that. You want to build your name, build your brand, and your CV. Um, basically, lifelong learning, right? Uh, through scientific uh, endeavor and um, sharing uh, your observations with the world. Um, and to do that. You can present information clearly and efficiently by way of what we covered today, poster presentations. Um, it's an established format within which you can be sort of creative. Um, I can't overemphasize enough that the poster is a visual aid, not a crutch, right? You're, the, you're presenting to a small group of people face to face um, and, you know, the poster is just sort of background. Um, but of course, uh, you know, your presentation skills are going to be a combination of speaking and referring to the poster itself. Um, the best idea ever won't mean anything if you don't communicate it effectively. And so I hope that this talk has um, sort of uh, helped you uh, prepare to uh, put together a great poster presentation. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And um, if you still uh, aren't sick of hearing me talk, um, we can certainly uh, have more uh, questions. Um, you'll see that, uh, as I said, this presentation is recorded, so um, there's the full link to our YouTube channel. There's the Bitly. Remember, I mentioned Bitly is a good resource. 
Uh, so you can jot that down really quickly and just go to that address, or you can just search YouTube for NCADE and it'll be the first thing that pops up. There's my email if you want to uh, talk more. I know there are some questions that we didn't get to answer. Um, and you can also find me at the LA campus or uh, you know reach me by phone. So feel free to do that.